Hey, well, welcome to Life After Addiction and Indictment. Uh, today, I've got a great guy with a great story. He's got a fantastic mission. Uh, J. Dan Gum, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Man, it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure, brother. It was uh, great. We uh, connected through a mutual friend online, and I had the pleasure and, and honor of being on his podcast a couple of weeks ago. And, and you know, he's got such a great thing going. We've got similar, you know, backgrounds when it comes to, you know, some time in prison and some abuse of uh, other substances and alcohol. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to bring you on today and, and uh, you know, have you share your message of what you're doing. You're doing a lot of great, great things out there. Uh, the podcast, uh, Background Check, uh, really, I, I love the title and love what you're doing with that. How did you come up with that? You know, the word background obviously has been a part of my story for a long time because as soon as I, I mean, I've been working on my background for a long time. <laughs> um, a lot of the years it was working on my criminal background. Um, but I think at one point when I got out of prison and, and the name Forgiven Felons, which is the name of our organization, uh, was already started, um, everything when I got out was a background check. And I was just like, you know what, that, that, that word is so negative. I want to turn it into something positive. I want to, I want, I want to not be afraid to say, you know what, check my background. I don't care. You know, and, and there's a, there's a phrase in my opening, um, my opening song background check podcast. There's a phrase that says, um, I don't want my background to hold me back. I want it to pay you back, pay me back. Yeah, in other words, that. you, you, I think the way it says, the way I said is your background shouldn't hold you back. It should pay you back. And, and basically what I mean by that is to leverage your bad past to uh -huh. help people in the future, yeah. you know, and whether that's something you get paid for or you get uh, accolades for or whatever, you know, you should be able to use what you've been through to help others, whether it, and make money, whether it's buy, you know, write a book or uh, be a life coach or whatever, you know? And so, um, so that's, that's how we came up with that. And um you know, and it's a great podcast. We have great stories like yours on there. And then we also have uh, st stories of people who help people with backgrounds uh, from judges to lawyers to uh, to lobbyists, advocates like um, one we were just talking about, you know, that, that came up with the second look bill. So it's fun. Uh, we're almost a year in and uh, we got 40. Uh, I think you were my 46 episode. We did 47 last week. So we're having fun and it's a blast, man, to tell help other people share their story. Yeah, it's like, you know, I think we even talked about it when I was on your podcast. You know, I don't think you're, I don't think you, you're a human being if you do something to really help somebody else and that gives you the best feeling that life can give. Yeah. You know, that's, there's nothing like it, you know, and I think that that's just comes from, you know, inside the way we were built. Um, and, uh, Anyways, yeah, just, that was one of the things I really, I, in just, fact, I think I highlighted that on the clip for you that you uh -huh. said that there's, you, you don't, there's no greater joy than being able really to take isn't. what you use and help somebody else. Yeah. And I was reading, you know, some stuff on your website, which is a great website, uh, forgivenfelons.org. And, you know, your mission, just like you were saying, it's, you know, helping people with a past realize their future. Um, you know, and then you, I think you said something like it's a testimony. Um, you know, your past to be a testimony of God's grace, but I just, I love what, you know, you stand for and what you're doing. Um, so how did forgiven felons come about? Um, I remember, you know, well, let me back up. So let's talk about um, how you ended up in prison and what was going on in your life that, that, uh, you know, found you being sent to prison. Well, the short high, the shortcut highway version is uh, when I was 13, I got, uh, had my first taste of alcohol and drugs Damn. and with an exception of taking my junior and senior year off of doing that stuff in high school. Um, I, I became an alcoholic at, in college and okay. Jack Daniels was my friend. I had a, had a deep intimate relationship with him. So deep, you know, you could tell a person's, uh, relationship with how deep they are with their significant other is if they have a tattoo of their name on their, <laughs> on the person. And I do, I have a tattoo of Jack Daniels on my left shoulder. Uh, so I love back then I loved to drink and I love to play cards. So one day we were playing cards and the back of a deck of playing cards was Jack Daniels. And somebody said, Hey, this would be a great tattoo. And so I got that, I got that, uh, 
tattoo. And so college, full-blown alcoholic, dropped out of college because of it. Um, tried to straighten up in the mid-90s for a couple of years. Went back to coach at my alma mater. Uh, was dating a nice Christian girl. Uh, was on probation for two years. Uh, didn't drink anything. Um, I think the only, only vice I kept during those two years was smoking cigarettes, uh, which I think is is eventually what led me back to my old life because it was the only thing I held on to from all my vices. And because of that, when I had the worst month ever in 1997, my girlfriend broke up with me for another man and the job let me go. I was just like, what am I going to do now? So I, I, you know, I doubled down on the smoking and then I was like, I might as well just start drinking again. So that led to my fourth and fifth DWI. Um, and which that led me to, uh, sitting on a stand in a courtroom, May 21st, 2003. And the judge said to the courtroom, I don't see a very bright future for Mr. Gum. And he was right at that time. Uh, and it's funny because when I got out of prison or really actually long, uh, just a few years ago, I, I, um, submitted a request for those court transcripts. Cause I wanted to see if that, that statement made it in the court transcripts uh-huh. and it did, it did. So I have my court transcripts where judge Gene can said, I don't see a very bright future for Mr. Gum. And you know what? He was right. If yeah. I didn't change anything at that point, he was absolutely right. My future was, was really bad. And he sent it to me to my fourth and fifth DWI five years, five years for each one of those, you know, my dad and my sisters were just crying in the courtroom and, but you know, my heart had gotten so hard. I grew up in the yeah. church and I grew such a hardness towards and a resistance towards everything that had to do with Christianity at one point. Um, and, and, and at that point was, was probably the hardest my heart had ever been. Yeah. Until I got to prison <laughs> prison yeah. challenged that hardness and said, I can raise you. And um, I never got affiliated with the gangs or anything like that, but you know, I, I fought and the first fight landed me in solitary confinement or ad seg, we call it. And for, for over just over a week, wasn't it? Uh, eight, days. eight days. And, uh, you know, and in, in, in those eight days, man, it was almost like I had a conversation with God every, every day, each day, you know, and every, I know some people are like, Oh, you don't really talk to God. Well, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I had some questions for God. Yeah. You know, um, and I think, I think in, at some level he listens no, and I think if, in my mind, yeah, and I think, I think if we sit still long enough and shut up, we can hear him too, whether it's hearing him in the quietness, whether it's hearing him in the, the loudness, whatever, you know? Um, and I felt like he just said, look, you haven't done anything bad enough. And I'd done a lot of bad things. Uh-huh. You haven't done anything bad enough for me to say, all right, I changed my mind. I don't want to do good things through you. And yeah. so, and, and listen, alcohol, drugs. At one point I was driving, um, I was working for an escort service. Oh, really? And I was driving girls around and after my training, and this was a huge, huge escort service in Dallas at the time, the biggest one in Dallas, they were just, it was, I mean, we were taking girls to, pro sports athletes houses after games and Uh and it it was huge and um i found it because the ad in the paper said bodyguard slash driver and i thought that sounds cool yeah so i go and i'm and i'm sitting there talking to a guy and he's talking drivers and dancers and i'm like this sounds like an escort service and so but you know i'm all in i worked my way up i started selling to every selling drugs to every girl that got in the car with me um but you know when i look back at that time I see God's hand of protection on my life. Cause I had a, I tell people I'm alive by the grace of God and my mama's prayers and my mama's prayers never stopped. And I look back during that year and a half, I was at this escort service and I had guns pointed to my head. I had so many bad things happen to me. And, uh, and, and it was funny because funny or whatever, awkward, weird, interesting that, when I was there, I, I talked to one of the girls and, I'm, and I was like, you look familiar. I think I know you from somewhere. She's like, yeah, your name sounds familiar too. She's like, are you so-and-so's brother? And I'm like, yeah, are you so-and-so's daughters? And, and she's like, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. Wow. And I don't know how many conversations we had at, 
you know, over the next however many months uh-huh. of like, how did we get from church to here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, um, you know, and, and it was, it was crazy, but it was just that one little thing that I look back on and God was kind of winking to me like, yeah, nowhere you can go where there's not somebody that I'm, I'm, I'm putting in your life that to let you know, you're not going to be here long. At some point you're going to turn everything around. Wow. I still, I'm still, I'm going to protect you in all of it. And so, you know, uh, man, I, I had a wreck. I had a wreck. I can send you the pictures too. uh, November, 20, 20, uh, 9th, 2001, my blood alcohol level was 0.267 and they start treating you for alcohol poison at 0.30. So I was almost there driving 95 miles an hour from the highway patrol. And I veered off the highway and then I tried to veer back on or back over the overpass and I, and I, and I ran oh off the bridge, gosh. uh, was thrown out of the van. Uh, this was a work van. I was cleaning carpets for my, one wow. of my good friends who let me drive the van because I didn't have, I didn't have my own car, you know, and he let me drive the van and, and I wrecked that van and I, I told it, um, it threw me out after its first couple of tumbles down the shoulder, down the, you down buckled the in or? Uh, I wasn't. No. And and if I had been buckled in, you'll see I the pictures. Yeah. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it. You'll see the pictures, how that, that whole section of, of the driver's side was just right. smashed in. So, um, wow. and then a couple pe- pieces of glass, as I got thrown out, pieces of glass went through my arm. I blacked out. I don't remember any of the wreck. Um, I remember leaving the club at 10 30 and some of my friends just coming to the club, I was leaving cause it was a Thursday night and I wanted to get home and, and get up early to go work. So I wasn't drunk at that point, 10 30, my friends are coming in, hadn't seen in a while wow. and you know how it is. Hey, come on in. And I got to go, no, we'll buy you some shots. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. And then 10 30, that's the last time frame I remember until wow. five, five 30 AM when I'm waking up and I'm watching them sew up my arm. You know, wow. that I had two different areas where they had to sew stitches in and, and immediately I was just like, pulled my arm down from them. I was still drunk. I mean, I was that, I was that yeah. had that much in my system and I began looking for a cigarette. You know, I'm in the hospital. I'm looking for yeah. a cigarette. Like Mr. Gum, you can't, you can't smoke in here. And I'm like, well, show me where the exit is. I'm going to smoke a cigarette and I'm just drunk as I'll get out. Before I got up and left the room, I heard the, um, the nurse come in and tell the officer, the officer escorted me to the hospital uh-huh. uh he said his blood alcohol levels 0.267 in case you want to you know charge him for anything and, and the officer said no he's just lucky to be alive he had one of the police officers who was across the highway in a pawn shop parking lot just hanging out you know probably trying to yeah you know uh scan radar people uh he watched me run off the bridge no way and so, cause he was faced, I already faced that direction and he watched wow. me run off the bridge. He ran over there and small town, you know, just south, south of Dallas, small town. Uh, he recognized the carpet cleaning van. So he called my sister, you know, at 1245 when the accident happened. And, uh, and he said, Joy, you need, you, you need to get up here where I am because I think from where I'm standing, it looks like your brother's not moving and he's dead. Oh my God. And so that scared the crap out of her. Oh, and man. so, so I'm, at five thirty in the morning, you know, and to this day, you could probably uh, understand this. I had tons of blackouts in my partying days, but most of the time, almost all the time, throughout the re- throughout the next day, I would remember the blackout would I would start to remember it, you know, stuff that I blacked out on. But to this day, that twelve forty five a.m. to five thirty a.m. blackout is nothing. still nothing. I, I don't remember anything from from well, actually, I don't remember anything from ten thirty to five thirty. So, so was the, and, injury, the glass and stuff, or did you just have other injuries or? Um, okay. So they said that I landed face down in the dirt and he, he thought that he told my sister on the phone that it looked like my head had been cut off because my head was buried in the dirt. So for two weeks, I'm sitting at my roommate's house and he's got, I'm laying on the back of the bed and the restrooms right across from me and he has to tie a rope to the knob of the door, uh, the doorknob, and then, and then hang it by the bed because I could not use any of my core muscles front or back because wow. it, what it, what it felt like to me was the result of, if you were to take your, 
your sternum and your spine and smash them together. That felt like what the impact of me landing on the ground may have caused every muscle in my upper torso, lower torso, front and back was just, I couldn't use it. And so I'd have to literally use my arm pulling the rope up just to set up to go to the restroom. And, and I was, I mean, I was a basket case for a few weeks, but you I mean, as soon as I was able to get up and walk around on my own, I was stealing my roommates, you know, liquor Back at it, and yeah. um, <laughs> did not wake yeah, up at all. Geez, there's a ton in there to unpack and talk about. But the, the thing that, that really hit me the most, because I, you know, I've lived it, experienced it, and frankly still struggle with it today is, you know, when you talked about having the conversation with God and, and uh, you know, sometimes if we'll quiet ourselves, you know, that, you know, we can hear from him. And, you know, I think I would assume I could be wrong here that, that's something most people struggle with because yeah. of the, the rat race, just the garbage that we allow ourselves to get so hung up on. And that's something I've really been working on because I mean, we, I remember coming out of rehab one night and I was in an outpatient situation yeah. and you may have experienced this as you're doing the things that, you know, you're not supposed to, what, you know, it's guilt pretty much that keeps you away from, God. Right. right? Yeah. So th that's when I wouldn't pray. Um, and I remember talking in the parking lot as we we're walking out to our cars to my dad and it's kind of explaining that he's like, you know, he's asked me, so have you been praying? I'm like, no. And why would I, he's not going to listen to me. Yeah. But I'll never forget his response, you know, and I believe this with every fire of my being is he's always there. Yeah. No matter what you're doing, he's never, he doesn't leave, you know? And, uh, that really impacted me. And, uh, you know, like you said, it's, it's something that I'm learning, you know, that you have to really work on. And, right. And as you do, you know, you, people can have other beliefs, whatever, um, you can call it God, you can call it spirit, you can call it energy, you can call it whatever you want. Right. But you can have that guidance throughout your life. You can call it even your intuition, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, and I just think that's really important. And I guess the reason I wanted to point that out is not only because it's impacted me in the past, but it's something I'm really working on right now. Um, because I've, I think because of pride, honestly, yeah, I lived most of my life just doing what Steve thought was best. And, and as I've looked back, had I slowed down and asked for guidance or help, there's definitely choices I wouldn't have made, yeah. you know, I believe or would have been guided not to make certain choices in business or whatever, you know? And, uh, you know, so I think that's important that, that people hear that, you know, I think we're at a, a place in the world, our country that we need God. Yeah. You know, and I, I've even been at points in my life where I was too prideful to even say that, Yeah. you know, and, and which I'm a little bit ashamed of, you know, I'm not beating myself up over it, but that's pretty sad. You know, we've got right. our priorities all out of whack. And first thing that happened to me when I was in prison was you realize really fast that the things that you love and care about the most, you typically take for granted, you know, yeah. you hurt the ones yeah. you love the most and, yeah. and don't intentionally do it. But anyway, so, so you end up then, you know, you get through that and you get back at the old drinking game and partying and, how long until you find yourself being sent to prison? Yeah. And so, uh, so at that point, the, the, um, the wreck, I was still, I came out of the wreck and I started working for Walmart as a manager and mainly because I didn't have a car anymore and I didn't have a job. Uh, and I was living less than a mile away from a Walmart. So I thought, you know what? I used to work for Walmart as a kid and, and, and I moved up through the ranks a little bit. Let me go back and see. Well, they weren't hiring except for on their remodel crew. And so I started on that and then people just see, saw the natural leadership ability. So they decided they wanted to hire me on and they hired me on, but it wasn't too long after that, that I got my fourth and fifth DWI within six months of each other. I got my first three back in the uh, early nineties. Uh, got number one and number two on a Friday and a, and a Tuesday in the same week. And then, and then, and then shortly a year, uh, less than a year later, I got my third one 
And it was all right in the nick of time, December uh, 16th, 1994, January 1st, the three DWIs is a felony law went into effect in Texas. So I got those first three in right in the nick of time. Yeah. But I did spend my first holiday in, in, in any kind of incarceration atmosphere uh, in 1994, that third DWI. Nobody bailed me out you know, right off the bat, yeah. like I either, I either bailed myself out or somebody else bailed me out, you know? And so my whole family comes up on Christmas Eve to see me in jail. And that was the first time I realized I'm looking at my brand new niece, who's only been uh, alive for a few weeks. I'm looking at her for the first time through plexiglass. And wow. that was the first time I realized that my, my decisions impact everybody, not just myself. Yep. And uh, so so I got my first three pretty quick. And then, and then I got my fourth and fifth one within a six month time frame. Um, I was going to get out of the, the fourth one, the court appointed attorney who didn't believe any of my story. And uh, I told her to, to check into it. She calls me back. That was in September of 2002, February, 2003. She calls me and goes, I'm going to get you off this fourth one uh, on a technicality. I'm like, great. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm an alcoholic. So I go celebrate by getting drunk. And that night, that night, the same night she called me to tell me that she was going to get me off the second, the fourth one. Um, I got my fifth one. <laughs> so I want people to pay attention. I mean, to understand that as how the disease works. I mean, yeah. how the mind works, you know, cause I've done many of those types of things and, and it's, you know, it is, it's a really messed up deal. Yeah. Um, so, so you end up then in prison, you're go. You're in SEG. Uh, yeah. I, I'm in Start. SEG. I finally get out and I'm a new person. I went in September. I went in September, um, September 18th, 2003, which is right at the beginning of football. I went in with literally 50 bets, <laughs> parlays. I yep. mean, I was, I love to gamble. Yeah. And I get out. And one of the days that, that we had a conversation with God was like, all right, God, I'm a, I'm a drinker. I'm a smoker. I'm a, I'm a cusser and I'm a, I'm a gambler and I'm a gambler. And I mean, my profanity back then, especially when I first went to prison was just, I mean, every other word was a cuss word, uh, you know, and I was an equal opportunity cuss word picker. I would, I would, I wouldn't just use one cuss word. I'd use them all. And, and it was bad, not for prison, but it was bad if I was right. going to get out and start preaching the gospel and sharing my story. You know, you don't want to cuss yeah. too much from the pulpit, you know, um, and so one of the days was like, all right, God, there's nothing in my natural body. The, the disease, the alcoholism had changed the chemistry, the physio physiology in my brain to where there's nothing inside of me that wants to stop drinking Jack Daniels. And so I said, God, you're going to have to do something in me because I can't help you with this. I don't want to stop. It's fun. I enjoy Jack Daniels. And, but I know I can't do this and do what you want me to do at the same time. So you're going to have to do something with that and the cigarette smoking because I enjoy them both. And there's nothing in my natural body that says, Hey, it'd be a good idea if you stop this. So I woke up one morning and it's really weird, dude. I mean, I just felt like a weight, a weight, a heavy weight was lifted off my body. I can't wow. explain it. I'm not even going to try. Cause that'd be like thinking that I know how God works and I don't know how he works. But from that day on, I didn't look at, think about, talk about uh, Jack Daniels and uh, smoking cigarettes ever again. I didn't the same way ever wow. again. And so, and, and I tell people April 9th, when I first went back into, into jail was my, was my clean date. Cause that's when I had to stop using alcohol yeah. and cigarettes. Right. But September 18th or that week, was like my emotionally, my emotional clean date. Because, okay. because up until then, I was still going to drink when I got out of prison. But on September 20th, when I woke up and I realized I don't even look at it the same way anymore. That was, that's my emotionally clean date. I don't know if that makes sense that's to you or not. To me, yeah. Yeah. So, so I get out. Uh, well, I, I feel that feeling and I'm like, all right, God, I, I'm still a cusser and I'm still a gambler. He goes, well, you need to work on those yourself. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Well, how do I do that? 
you know, in prison. How do you tell people you're stop? You're not going to cuss right. anymore in prison, and you're not going to gamble when you have 50 bets out. You're going to get beat up. And it was a good thing I was big and ugly because it helped me, uh, you know, not get into a lot of fights. So, but yeah, I went through about a three or four month period where I was trying to cut down on my cussing, stop my gambling. But you know, when everybody, whenever you try to stop doing something, I mean, everybody knows I'm a Steeler fan. I'm a Steeler fan. And so I bet against the Cowboys because I was a Cowboys hater. And er, as soon as everybody knew that I was not going to gamble anymore, <laughs> they they came up to me, and they, and I'm a Cowboy hater. I never bet for the Cowboys. I don't care how bad the bet was. I would never bet for the Cowboys. They come up to me and go, hey, I'll give you the Cowboys and 21 points. And I look up at God. I'm like, even you know that's a good bet, you know, and I'll take yeah. the bet. And, uh, you know, but it took me three or four months. I'd say the length of football season um, to finally get to the point where profanity and gambling didn't control me. You That's, know what I mean? Yep. Um, I'm not saying I've never said a cuss word again since then or never made a bet, but it, it's never controlled me right. since then. And I think that's, that's the line that everybody, you know, sometimes has is in denial about crossing is when they first start doing things, they control the thing. But then at some point there's a line they cross and they don't even see it. We don't even see it where now we're being controlled by, by the thing, yep. not controlling the thing. And that's where some people can see that line and stop. Not very many, but some people can, yep. and God bless those people. <laughs> but I wasn't one of them, you know, Either. <laughs> that's for so, sure. so I, you know, I got out, and went through that journey, straightened my life up. Um, two guys, I had to humble myself, let two guys mentor me. Um, that was hard for me, you know, but oh, that yeah. was part of, that was part of my journey of pride too. Yep. Um, then those guys get out and I'm like, all right, y'all go kick some butt out in the world, man. And they get out and within a year, now I'm mentoring guys. And then within a year before I even make parole, I hear that those two guys that mentored me are back in prison. Back in. Wow. And so I got to see the cycle of recidivism up close and personal and, and it pissed me off. Yeah. But it motivated me too. Cause I was like, all right, God, I want to be a part of this dadgum solution. And that's when, you know, uh, cause I was like, I was scared. I was like, God, I got, I got a question for you. Uh -huh. you, you know, those guys that you anointed <laughs> and gifted and powered, empowered to, to mentor me, they didn't even make it out there. Yeah. So how am I going to make it? And he said, I'm going to give you this dream. And as long as you pursue this dream, you won't come back to prison in this capacity. Wow. And that, and that dream was, uh, that was code language that I understood because one of the first books I read in prison was called The Dream Giver. Oh, yeah. I literally just started that on my Audible last week. <clears throat> so, and, and how God has given everyone a dream. Yep. And, but we're so caught up in the land of familiar that we're afraid to pursue it. And you know, and so when he said that, then that he began to unfold the dream in my life of, of having transitional houses, speaking, sharing my testimonies, writing a book, which has taken me a, a long time, but I'm still, I am doing it. I don't, you know, I'm scared because I could speak huh. confidence, but man, when I sit down to write, even if I sit down to dictate my writing, dude. it's a mental block and go, yeah, dude, you may be speaking, but you're still writing a book. And then I'm just Maybe like, we should I'm, be checking in with each other a couple of times a week. Cause I'm in that exact same process. And I've got <laughs> Other people helping me, they're kind of waiting on me, you know. Yeah. So I get it. It's I have that exact same thing. I just uh, kind of block. It's like someone can get me to the idea or to the you know, remembering certain things that I can go, but man, it's a struggle. So I hear you. I, I think I don't know what a, what what the turning point will be for me if I close my eyes and pretend like I'm on stage speaking and just tell my whole story and then let somebody else break it all up into chapters and outlines and all that. Cause I get stuck, you know, I get stuck with stupid stuff. Like, Lord, I don't even know what the, you know, the name of my book should be. Yep. Well, that, that should not be something that should stop you from writing your book. You should just write it. Yeah. Uh, but, but I got, I, I think I got a couple titles that are good titles. I still get drunk. I've just switched bartenders. That, <laughs> yeah. That'll be, that'll be my recovery book. And then the, the other one will be by the grace of God and mama's prayers. And that'll, that'll have a, pr that. that'll have a prayer journal attached with it. Yeah. Of all the, all the prayers that my mom prayed over me while, while I was going through all my old, you know, old ways. So, so, you know, I, I began to facilitate and foster the dream inside prison, get out. I've been out uh, April 18th, 
April 18th will be my 15th year out of prison. Yeah, so, awesome. uh, as soon as I got out, as soon as I got out, we filed the DBA, started forgiving felons, started mentoring, discipling. We had huge services, kind of like group meetings. Um, and then eventually in 2012, we opened up the first transitional house, 2013. Uh, it was a duplex, so we just opened up the other side a year later. And, uh, you know, we've been doing that now for nine years, nine years um, uh, this year. And Fantastic, man. We're, we're tired of just uh, – helping the guys in our house we want to help the whole dallas fort with metroplex so we're going to open up a resource center and it's going to have so many things that are going to help people coming out of prison uh straight out of prison but also people that have been out for a while that are on the verge of going back unless they get some sort of education training you know motivation skills all this stuff and encouragement that's what i love about you know aaron what your story is and then i want to point out to those li the listeners is you know, because we both have some similarities in what we're trying to do. And the key is you got to believe, first of all. Yeah. You know, you got to you got to have a desire. Right. You know, just like anything, because it's so easy. And I think, unfortunately, majority of the population is this way. And I'm not trying to act like I'm up here and you're up here, you know, because I still struggle with the same thing at times. And that's just going on with status quo, right? You know, it's so important for us to realize that God put us here to have everything and anything that he created. And that is to live our dream and right. to have the best life. But if we don't believe it and don't choose to take the steps, which you've obviously done to create it, then life creates itself for us. Yeah. And that's where people got to understand that you can have it, but you got to choose it and be intentional and believe in it. Because I also believe that through however God's created everything, that just that belief and feeling it helps bring it about, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's so cool, you know, what you've done and and how it started. And so how, I think I read it somewhere, but I'm not going to try to count on my memory. I mean, you've impacted lots of, of guys and, and gals, I maybe, I don't know, but tell us a little bit about you know, what your houses do. And, and then I want to hear a little bit more about this resource center because we talked about it a couple of weeks ago and that's, yeah. that's incredibly incredible. Well, what you're doing. well, one of the first things we did when we first got out of prison was, was try to just, um, and we did help a lot of males, females, families of, uh, that had incarcerated individuals, you know, and, and it's just about trying to help people change their mindset from being a felon yeah. to being a forgiven felon. And the difference is um, one is stuck in rejection. One is stuck in uh, victim mindset, poverty mindset, you know, and, and yes, even though someone's a felon, they can be a victim once they get out of here, uh, oh, yeah. a prison, they can be a victim of the obstacles that society puts forth for us. You know, I, I, there for quite a while. Yeah. And, and whether it's a job, whether it's housing right now, we could find guys coming out of prison, 15, 16, $17 an hour jobs but housing, we can't find housing anywhere, wow. you know? So I'm, I'm actually talking to some uh, developers right now to see how we can start some small subdivisions of, of uh, either duplexes, quadplexes, something affordable for somebody to buy, but also that we can just rent to these families because it's not just guys coming out of prison. It's families who are growing. Maybe they got married. One of them has a felony. They found a one bedroom apartment in a shanky area but now they're having kids. Now they need two and three bedroom apartments. So they're trying to move yeah. or to a two, two, three bedroom house. They're trying to move because their family's growing. He's doing great. She's doing great. But because one of them still has a felony, they can't live anywhere. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it is just getting harder and harder and harder, but we're, we're going to hopefully solve that issue one day, but that's, that's a bigger dream down the road. But, but, um, but forgiven felons, you know, it started as a mindset change and I was like, all right, God, this word felon is going to be attached to my name. It's negative. Uh, what can I do to get rid of it? He's like, nothing. You're going to, you're going to be, a, you're going to be a felon the rest of your life, but let's change the way you look at that word felon. And so he said, the only way you can change the, the, the perspective of a noun is to put an adjective in front of it. And so from the beginning, just when we were discipling, mentoring people, that's what we've, we've been trying to do. And so in 2012, we opened up the house, the first house and these guys coming out of prison, you know I mean, I had 50 people from my church meet me at CC's Pizza when I got home uh, that first night, you know, wow. and then my mom and dad took me to their home. I had people throw money, jobs at me. Not everybody has that. No kidding. 
And, and so I wanted to be that for other people. So now when people get, when people get out, we give them food, hygiene, clothes, uh, bus passes. Uh, we, we, we take them places that they need to go. Um, and then we, we teach them life skills. We teach them how to navigate the computer guys that have been locked up 25 and 30 years that, that, that weren't able to take classes in prison that could teach Uh them how to navigate on the computer. Uh, some guys, you know, need help going into Chick-fil-A into the bathroom because everything is automated in there. They don't know how to turn the, you know, they, they get lucky with the soap because they think if they just yeah. push on it, you know, that yeah, that's exactly. the reason it came out, but it, but it didn't come out cause they push it. But then they're like, Jaden, Hey, how do you turn the, the water on? You know? And I'm like, just stick your hands underneath there, you know? And, and so, yeah, it does. It does. And so we teach them all these things you know, um, and we help them. We, we develop relationships with them. We're different from other, uh, any other halfway house, transitional house in that we're, we're not about the money. Cause we don't, we don't make a lot of money on this. Um, you know, we, we, it's pretty much a wash. If I don't get any outside donations, what the guys, what we charge the guys to live there pays all the bills. So I have to raise money because, you know, sometimes we take somebody in off the street and they got bed bugs and we got to do yeah. spend $3,000 to get rid of bed bugs. Or sometimes guys leave on good terms and we give them all their furniture in their room. So we got to buy furniture, replace what's in the room. Um, you know, and, but, but what we do is we connect them with jobs. We have connections with jobs. So everybody that comes out just gets a job within two weeks. Um, so and I know how tough that can be. Yeah. You know, and, and we've got so many stories, you know, uh, the easiest way is to watch the documentary forgiven felons and it's on Roku or to be TV. There's three, three episodes, about 35 minutes each. And it has just uh, outside of myself, six other guys on there that have come through our house and uh, you know, it kind of, kind of follows what they did, you know, and, and then it says where they are now, of course, where they are now was about two years ago. Yeah. Um, we may do an up, updated documentary on where are they, yeah. where are they now since the documentary, but uh, just doing, just doing great, you know, and, and, um, but we want to do more. I think that's the sign of any good uh, entrepreneur, just anybody in life who just doesn't settle for that. Because like in the book, the dream giver, you'll see, even when he gets to the dream now, after a while, his dream becomes the the land of familiar again. And God's like, all right, give me that dream. And we're like, no, we just got here. Nope. Because if you, if you, if you don't give me that dream, it's going to become the land of familiar and you're not going to chase after a bigger dream. And so we want a bigger dream. Now we want to help more. And, um, and so I may have to like not do the program housing for a little bit to focus on the resource center, but we'll always have those, those, those first two homes, but we we're not going to expand the housing until we get the resource center going. But this thing, man, the resource center is going to be amazing. Yeah, it's phenomenal what you've what? done and what you're doing. And well, I think what you just said there is like, I remember hearing growing up from my grandpa, you know, he used to say good isn't good enough, you know, and so often we settle for just good. And uh, I like, tell guys, good is the enemy of great. There you go. Bingo. That's the way. Good is okay. But you, you, if you're, if you're, if you're settling for good, then you're, you're sacrificing great. Yep. And we're so, all meant to be great. Yeah, Absolutely. That's fantastic. So as far as, you know, donations and stuff, you guys, uh, can they do it on your website? Yeah, absolutely, man. On the website, there's a donate page. Um, So many ways you can give. A lot of people don't want to give uh, money. Money. So if you go to Amazon and and look up wish list, uh, look at forgiven felons. Oh, cool. Uh, We have an Amazon wish list on there that they they can purchase stuff right, right off Amazon and it sends it directly to our, and these are just tangible things we use around the house. Yeah. Um, also if you, um, if you have an Amazon account, which I think everybody does now, uh, on your desktop, go to smile.amazon.com okay. and lo- log in with your regular credentials. Uh, but then every time you buy something, it, uh, it donates, Amazon donates a portion of that price back to forgiven oh, films. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you do smile, Amazon smile, you can choose what charity you want to, you want to do. And even if you don't for, uh, choose forgiven films. You know, there's plenty of other charities you can choose. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many ways, but yeah, donate. You can donate with a debit card, credit card, right from the website. Um, you can also download the roundup app that it sounds like the weed killer, but it's really just, it's round up your change. You know, you could connect oh, your yeah. debit card 
and, and we are a 501c3 so everything you give uh we 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 can write it off whether you're a person that owns a building in dallas fort worth that we we need a building right now so if you want to donate a building oh, man, you can bad. do that um and uh but yeah it, it, we're gonna have welding uh audio video productions um graphic art design handyman business all this stuff we're gonna have classes for and businesses um we're gonna have the businesses that we will run the guys will be employed but we'll all but we'll also have business opportunities so if we if somebody comes in and they're a painter and they're working for our, our handyman business painting helping us paint stuff but we see potential in them to own their own painting company then we want to sit down with them and teach them how to have their own business and even give them even give them the startup costs you know like i mean yeah. for five thousand dollars we can get them a we can get them a four thousand dollar cash truck and a thousand dollars worth of paint equipment and they can they can make their own money that's so great. that's what we're trying to do well it's a great great what you've done and fantastic what you're looking to do you know it's inspiring and and i look forward to you know pushing them your message out there and and seeing what we can do to make an impact and help you know and i speak everywhere i'm invited I, I you know we haven't been able to go back into the prisons i get invited to go go speak at a lot of prisons uh before COVID, i got invited to speak at a lot of uh, youth retreats uh other you know different seminars and different things um so if you need a motivational speaker um awesome. you know i'm there too if you need to do a virtual virtual one i can do that too well that's great well i appreciate your time we'll uh, obviously have all the links to the things we've discussed so you can connect and donate and and uh, i'll make sure to spread the word amongst my family there's a lot of amazon stuff that shows up at this place and make sure that they use that smile in front and give them for giving felons and yes and uh, see what we can do to make an impact as well so and background um, check podcast if you want to hear great stories man including including steve's yeah it was it's a great podcast i probably listened to six seven episodes now and it is it's great so um that's on basically anybody's favorite platform. You can find oh, yeah. that uh, background check. And, and when you go, and when you go to uh, our website, there's a, there the show pages on our website. So when perfect. you go to the show page, you can actually see uh, other, other pictures, you know, like if somebody has an organization and they have pictures um, you know, we put pictures and stuff of, of what their organization does. Um, I didn't, awesome. I didn't, I didn't get a bunch of pictures from you. Cause I didn't know if you wanted me just to post a bunch of random pictures of you, but, but if they go to the website, they could see uh, pictures, you know, some pictures and video links and different, oh, different cool. things on the show page. So is that, that's the forgiven films. Forgiven films. And then, and then and when you click on background check podcast page, it takes you right to our show page and, uh, awesome. and it's pretty, it's a pretty fun page. Thanks for having me on, man. Hey man, it's my pleasure. It's uh, like we said at the beginning before we started recording is, you know, this is just fun. It's just fun to connect with people and just, you know, chat and, and hopefully, you know, say just one or one thing that impacts one person, it's all worth it, you know? So don't give up on your dreams. And, and like you've talked about the, the thing that you work on first with, with everybody. And the thing that I'm, I focus on the most with those that I'm working with is mindset, you know, yeah. and uh, that's where it all starts, no matter what you're dealing with. And so I actually wrote a I actually wrote a PDF, an ebook that's just a uh, mindset is the key.net. So if you want to go grab that, it's free. Um, but yeah, appreciate it. Go check out the website and, uh, you know, donate whatever you can do to help. Let's uh, see if we can make a difference and uh, get that resource center up and rolling and, and uh, start impacting more people's lives. Amen. Okay, my man, I appreciate it. And we'll talk, right. talk to you soon. See you down the road. All right. All right. Bye. Where the hell's my record? <laughs> I shrunk the screen so it wasn't showing. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs>